right, let's take our Bibles and open up to Ephesians chapter number 2. Ephesians chapter number 2. We'll begin in verse number 11, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 11. Now we've been preaching through this book and through this chapter as we've looked already. When you look toward the end of the chapter especially, he deals with the fact that the church is likened unto a temple, a holy temple in the Lord. The first chapter likens the church to a body, and of course we refer to the body of Christ. Those of us who are saved are in that body. But then here in chapter 2, he likens the body or the church to a temple and a holy temple unto the Lord. So we talk some about God building his temple in verses 1 through 9 and the fact that he had some pretty rough materials to work with, and that's you and me. And he took those materials and he put his mercy on them. And I like verse number 4 because everything changes when you get to verse number 4. But God. You know, when you get to those impassable places, you need to remember those two little words. But God. You think, well, so-and-so, nobody, uh, God could never save that, sir, that, that person. God could never do something for that person. Remember, but God. And so we learn of his great mercy. And then uh, we preached last uh, Wednesday some about works. And, of course, we know salvation is not of works, verses 8 and 9. But in verse number 10, we're created for his workmanship. And God saved you so you could work for him and serve him. He created you and saved you, not just from hell, but he saved you to be a good testimony and a witness for him in this present world. There's something for us to do. We are to live a life that is pleasing unto him. And that's in every facet of our life. So we talk some about works. We have God's work for us. And thank God Jesus Christ accomplished the work. It's paid in full by what Jesus, just like the song they sang. It's been nailed down by what Jesus Christ did on the cross. That's his work. But then we have God's work in us. God does something inside of you. He gets a hold of you. And Paul says, I want to apprehend that for which I am apprehended of in Christ Jesus. We need to get a hold of what got a hold of us. There's something on the work on the inside of us. And God just begins to deal with you and he works on you. And there's something taking place in your life as you go through different stages of your life, different, different circumstances of your life. God begins to do something with his word inside of you. And then it's not only God's work in us, but it's through us. He begins to use us as a blessing and an example to other people. So we talked about God's work and how that he does that for a reason. In verse number 10, God wants you to serve him and work for him. We don't work in order to get saved. We work because we're saved. A Christian ought to have good works. Shame on us when unsaved people have better testimonies of things than we do. That shouldn't be. You should be the best worker on your job because you're a Christian. You should be the best citizen in your town because you're a Christian. You should be the best person in your neighborhood and the best friendliest neighbor because you're a Christian. Amen. Good works. Paul speaks a lot about good works. Now here, the last part of the chapter, verse 11 all the way through the end, I want to preach some about, this is my title tonight, you college-age students, you'll appreciate this, and young people, University Christians. University Christians. Now, the reason I say that is because we're going to look at this thing about unity. And there's more on unity a little bit later in chapter number 4. So we're going to get into some practical things when we get over to chapter number 4. But here in chapter 2, he lays the groundwork of how we can have unity when there's so much diversity. You know the word university comes from those two words, unity and diversity. Supposedly, in the ideal college campus setting, you have diverse people coming from all over the place, but then there's a unity in the common denominator sitting at the feet of knowledge, wanting to learn and so forth. And so that idea of unity in diversity, which is really a complete misnomer in today's culture and society because the Bible's been ousted. The diversity of letting a Bible-believing Christian, especially on a public college campus and a public college classroom, voice their views is completely unheard of. And so we understand that. However, 
as far as believers in Christ, we have unity in diversity. I've been around people from different backgrounds. I'm a Southern. And by the way, I'm American born and, and American bred, but I'm Southern by the grace of God, right? I, I'm, I'm not ashamed of being from the South. I have South in the mouth. I mean, I am just Southern. I like fried chicken. I like country fried steak, okra. I like my okra greasy enough to my socks fall down when I eat it. I mean, I, I like Southern food. Nothing against the Northern people. I know they have their stuffing and they have their pasta and they have their munchies or whatever they have up there, but that's fine. Just give me my okra and fried chicken and black-eyed peas and uh, cornbread. I'm from the South. But you know what? It is a blessing sometimes to get around people from other parts of the country, get around people from other cultures. I like to travel sometimes when I get to preach in different places and be around people from different parts. And it's a blessing because I see Jesus Christ in their life. Complete, total background, but then I see Christ shining through their life and different things and how they're living for God. And complete, different, there's no way in the world we would have anything in common because we're from different backgrounds and all of a sudden we're sitting in church together, singing hymns together, opening the Bible together, listening to preaching together, telling people about Christ together. What an amazing thing. You talk about unity and diversity. The true Bible-believing Christian has that. I want us to look at this tonight. You'll notice we're products of God's grace, verse number 10. Obviously, we're His workmanship. Then we're partners with Israel, verses 14 through 18. We're people of God, verse number 19, and then we're pillars of the temple, verses 20 to 22. University Christians, first of all, let's look at 11 to 13. Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh, made by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Notice the blood that invites. The blood that invites. I like verse number 13. Made nigh by the blood of Christ. You know, uh, we talk about the King James Bible a lot and how we lift up the King James Bible. One reason you know these other Bibles aren't right is how they attack the blood of Christ. When you have verses in these new versions that omit passages on the blood of Christ, that should be a red flag. That's something should go up and say, something's not right. When these churches, they like to sing the hymns and they don't want to talk about the blood and they don't want to mention that, there's, there's a red flag. Because, beloved, if you're saved, you're saved by the blood. There's power in the blood of Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Leviticus, it's the blood that makes atonement for the soul. When Jesus Christ died on Calvary's cross, his blood had to be shed. You got those apostate preachers like MacArthur, and they say there's nothing in the blood, you know, the superstition thing that the blood of Jesus saves. The atonement is in the death. I say hogwash on that. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. And if Jesus' blood was not shed on the cross, you couldn't be saved. The blood invites us. Now think about us. Most of us here, I don't know any Jews out here, we're Gentiles. And when you go back in history and you read, really study some things early on, here's Noah, he gets off the ark, and of course things go a little well for a while, and God says we're going to set up some government and some boundaries and th some things, and, and instead of doing what God tells them to do and to spreading out and scattering and multiplying and so forth, they all to get together and build a tower and try to exalt themselves, and God says this ain't going to work. So he says, phooey on the nations. And he picks one man named Abram. And he calls him out from his family and says, I'm going to make of you a great and mighty nation. I'll bless the whole world through you. And he specifically deals with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and gives them. The storyline from the Bible changes there out. It goes from nations to one individual, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Salvation is of the Jews. What about the Gentiles? We are referred to by the Jews as dogs. Even the Syrophoenician woman, a Gentile, when she came to Christ begging for him to heal her daughter of the vexed devil that she had, he says, is it meat to take the children's bread and give it to dogs? Looking at her. And of course, she got, probably got down on her knees and says, I might be a little dog, but if I'm an old Gentile dog, can I get a crumb out from under the table? And she kind of pulled him out of his dispensation for a minute, and he said, okay. And he said, your, your faith is great. And of course, he healed her daughter. But that's what we are, Gentiles. If you go back and study your history and you think, oh, I'm proud to be an American and proud to be a Southerner like all this kind of stuff, 
You go back, I guarantee I don't care what family tree you come out of, we can find some moss growing on the wrong side of the tree somewhere. Amen. Amen. And you look at our ancestors and you go back and study some things, you're going to find cannibals, you're going to find brutal people, you're going to find some people that have not always been so nice. So what are you and what am I? We're, a lot of us are mutts, that's what we are. Now you think about Gentiles, you think about the pagan religions of this world, that was our background. And here he says in verse number 11, notice some things. We were uncircumcised. Verse number 11. Notice we were also unwelcomed. Verse number 12. Without Christ being aliens. So you believe in aliens? Yeah, verse number 12. There's aliens among us. Hey, before you were saved, you were an alien. You were an outsider. Now, obviously, verse number 12, he's dealing with the commonwealth of Israel. So we were outside of that covenants, of those covenants of promise that were given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Notice, having no hope and without God in the world. We were unwelcome. We were uncircumcised. We were unrelated, unhopeful. Look at that, verse 12. Without, he said, having no hope. That's probably the, uh, one of the worst words in the English language would be hopeless. You ever gotten to a situation is you say it's hopeless? Maybe you're just in a, some of you ladies working on a recipe or even guys, you're trying to cook something like me, you know, and you forget an ingredient. And, uh, you know, if, it, if it's not toast or eggs, you know, I pretty much can't cook it. Um, throw something on the grill or whatever. But if you forget something, then finally you realize you haven't gone too far and it's hopeless. There's nothing you can do to remedy the situation. And... It's just done. You're working on something, the thing's shot, the engine's blown, whatever. It, you, you're to a point, there's nothing that can be done. That's, that was the idea. Before you were saved, you had no hope. And there is no hope in this world. Outside of Jesus Christ, there is no hope. And so when people try to grab a hold of things that they try to build themselves, I think of the environmentalist type of mentality. They're trying to find meaning in saving the environment. You know, don't use your hairspray and, and the climate change is starting all these fires and starting all these hurricanes and, and we're destroying ourselves and we need to save the whales and the butterflies and, and everything else. It's almost like they're trying to find some meaning and purpose by saving an animal. Or something like that. I don't, I don't understand that. There's no hope. Without Jesus Christ, there's no hope. Yeah, let's say you do live a good life. Let's say you save some birds. And let's say you save a tree or whatever. You know, and you save a tree, then you die. And I come along behind you and cut it down. I mean, that's you, your whole existence was for what? I mean, there's no hope in that. At the end of the day, without Jesus Christ, they die without Christ. They go to hell. There's no hope. Hopeless. Unhopeful, and then look in verse number 12 also, without God, ungodly. That's what, that's what it is, ungodly. You know, godliness is not, all, is not sinlessness. You can be godly or striving for godliness, and it doesn't mean that you don't have problems in your life, okay? It means that God, you know, the Bible says in Psalm 10, the wicked, it says, God is not in all of his thoughts, He's not worshiping God in spirit and in truth. He's not thinking about God. He's not meditating on God. And, and here's somebody that may be godly, but they might not have everything cleaned up yet. But they're striving for it. They're thinking about God. They're praying. They're working on things. When God, the Holy Spirit, reveals things in their life, they deal with it and they pray about it and they confess it. Ungodliness is when God is not even in your thoughts at all, except by way of a curse word. Sometimes the only time they say the name of Jesus is when they cuss. And they get upset and they, they use God's name to try to put emphasis on their lack of a vocabulary to stress things. You know, the blood invites us who were without hope, who were uncircumcised, unwelcome, unrelated. You know, when Jesus Christ came, the Bible says in Matthew chapter 1, part of the Christmas story, which we know he's born king of the Jews, we understand that he had to come as king of the Jews because the Bible says in Matthew 1, he came to save his people from their sins. So you have to understand the Jewish context of the coming of Christ. He is the Messiah. He's the king of the Jews. But then it goes beyond that. Because he's the savior of all men. And then when John the Baptist sees him there across that Jordan River, he points that gnarly finger and he says, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Thank God, he, obviously he's the king of the Jews. Obviously he's going to die for the sins of the Jewish people, but he died for all of our sins. The blood invites us. 
In the Old Testament, when you read about the Mosaic Covenant, some of the stipulations when the, in the law, it's pretty rough. The law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Under that Old Testament law, when they came into the land of Canaan, they were to make no, um, no treaties and, and things like that with the inhabitants of the land. They were to be separate from those Gentiles. And it's a rough situation when you begin to look at the Jews versus the Gentiles. Under Solomon's reign, there's a little reprieve because some Gentile nations, like the Queen of Sheba, they come and they learn about the God of Israel. But Gentiles were without hope. They were outside of the blessings of the covenants of promise. He told Abram, he said, In thee all families of the earth will be blessed. If, if I'll bless those that bless you and I'll curse those that curse you. But when Jesus Christ died on the cross, his blood was shed not just for the Jews, it was shed for us dirty dog Gentiles. And the blood says, why don't you come on? The blood says, you know, that Old Testament law said get away because you're not a Jew. The New Testament grace of God says come in even though you're not a Jew. Come on in. The blood of Jesus Christ invites us. You know, there's not a sin too big that you've committed that the blood can't forgive you of. I really believe that. I really, if I didn't believe it, I wouldn't preach it. I believe you can be five minutes, you can be on death row, and you can be about, about to be put to death, and the gospel can be presented, and a person can receive Jesus Christ by faith and be saved forever, then and there. They can be completely forgiven and saved and go to heaven as soon as they die. No time to live a good life. No time to remedy all the wrongs they've done. No time to go back and make up. You can't make up anyway. They die and go to heaven. Why? Because the blood invites sinners. And I'm glad the blood invites us. Thank God for the blood. So we have the blood that invites, but notice in verses 14 through 18, we have the body that unites. Verse 14, for he is our peace who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments ordained in or, contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. We have the body that unites. That's why I call this university Christians. We're all saved. Jew or Gentile, you're in one body. Now see, this is a distinction you find in the church age. If someone trusts Christ, whether they're Jew or Gentile, they're in one body. There's not a, a separate distinction. And so you want to understand in the Old Testament, obviously God had the Old Testament law. The Jews had to worship according to that law. They had to literally bring those sacrifices to a physical place at a temple structure. Gentiles were banned from coming into that temple structure. As a matter of fact, um, outside of uh, Herod's temple, they found, the archaeologists uh, found an inscription that said this, No foreigner may enter within the barricade which surrounds the sanctuary and enclosure. Anyone who is caught doing so will have himself to blame for his ensuing death. Gentiles are ousted. They're not to come into the holy place. That's a place for Jews. There's a, middle, there's a wall of partition. And that wall of partition separates Jews and Gentiles. And there's a distinction there. One reason that you know the church will not go through the great tribulation per, uh, period. We believe in the pre-tribulation rapture. Amen. I hope the Lord comes back before I'm done with this message. He can finish it up on the way up, you know. He can give the invitation on the way up. One reason you know the church is not going through the Great Tribulation, when you read the book of Revelation, there's a distinction made between Jews and Gentiles. There's not a church. See, in this age, there's no distinction. If I had a Jew sitting in here, full-blooded Jew from Jerusalem, I preached to him the same gospel I preached to you. He needs to receive Jesus Christ by faith in order to be saved, and he'll be in the same body. There's no distinction. But when you read the book of Revelation, there's a distinction made between what the Jews are doing and what the Gentiles are doing. And those Jews are to keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. There's a distinction made. There's no distinction here in the church age. The middle wall is busted down. We're in one body. And you need to understand that. This is what we call unity. And so we have this idea that's brought up. You'll see it pop up a couple of times. Notice in verse number... Uh, 16, reconcile. And then he mentions enmity. We don't use the word enmity a whole lot. You read it over in the book of James. He talks about 
uh, being at enmity with the world and so forth, the world being at enmity with God. The word enemy is how I define it oftentimes. Enmity is similar to the word enemy. It means to be at odds against. So we have enmity here mentioned in the passage, and we have reconciliation. If you're going to reconcile something, you're going to bring something that's apart or pushed apart, you're going to bring it together. So we have the idea of enmity. Surely we have, first of all, enmity against God. That's what I want us to see first. Here's Adam and Eve. They sin. They get kicked out of the garden. There's a bridge. There's a, a bridge that's busted. There's a wall put up, if you will, between them and God. There's enmity. He says, know you not that the friendship of this world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. The reason there's enmity with other people and there's not true uh, unity in this world is because of sin. That's the reason. Now in our country, you know what you're seeing with a lot of the racial stuff that you're seeing today? You're seeing people use what they call racism to spark and to pull political votes. That's exactly what's taking place. And they're trying to pit people against one another. It's been done for ages. And the reason that people can get so at odds with one another is because of sin. So the first problem is, you don't have a problem with your brother. First of all, you got a problem with God. And until your problem with God is right, you're not going to get any problem with your brother right. And so there's no way you can have peace on this earth with individuals and humanity peace until there's peace with God. There's not going to be any peace on this earth until the Prince of Peace returns. Until this world is willing to submit under the authority of Jesus Christ, they're not going to have peace. And they're not going to have inward peace either. You ever seen those signs or stickers or whatever? It says, no God, no peace, no God, no peace. And of course they use the first no as K-N-O-W. No God, K-N-O-W, no peace. Then they say, no God, N-O, no peace. Until you know God, you won't be able to have peace between you and God. And then socially... Not just spiritually, but socially, you can't have peace with anybody else outside of Christ. There's no way. You know, we all got too many warts on us. We all have too many um, crazy ways that are so distinct from one another. I mean, good night. How can people get along? How can somebody be stay married for 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 years? And how can uh, people get along and, and have unity and things like that? We, we get so set in our ways sometimes, and individuals sometimes have personalities that clash. You ever get around somebody and just you, you just don't mix too well? I mean, you say one thing, they say the opposite. You suggest one thing, they say, suggest the opposite. It's just, of course, sometimes opposites attract. If that's you and your wife or you and your husband, maybe that's a good thing, okay? Like a magnet, I don't know. Uh, but sometimes people clash, and there's that clash that takes place, and without Jesus Christ in your life, Helping you forgive and forget and love, you're not going to be able to get along with people. And so this idea that's brought up between Jews and Gentiles, you have to keep in mind, we, we're dealing with it some in Sunday school in the book of Acts as we go through. You're dealing with a cultural change, especially with the early church, with the Jewish Christians, because they were taught in Judaism you don't hang around Gentiles, period. And now the wall's been busted in two, and Peter even got caught up into a, into a dissimulation, and Barnabas got caught up in it. They didn't want to be seen eating with Gentiles, and Paul had already got with them and discussed this thing at the Council of Jerusalem in Acts 15 and said, look, we're all saved the same way. You need to learn how to get along together. And Peter had kind of gotten carried away and didn't want to be seen with the Gentiles. And Paul had to rebuke him in Galatians chapter 2. He said, look, what are you doing? We're teaching that we're brothers in Christ. You need to get along. And he had to get on to Peter for that because the cultural change was so strong for them. I mean, they had a hard time even with the foods and the, the traditions that they had. And they had to change midstream. And so that was especially hard for early Christians. So I think the tension that's there we might not realize between Jews and Gentiles, but in the early church it most certainly was there. And he says, look, the wall's broken down. Enmity with God is taken away, and then enmity between one another is taken away. Notice in verses 19 through 22, finally we have a building that delights. Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens 
with the saints and of the household of God. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Verse number 19, no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens. Fellow citizens can have fellowship. Haven't y'all missed some of our fellowships? Fellowship dinners, especially. The desserts and the food and all. And been sitting around being able to talk and fellowship some. We haven't got to do a whole lot of that because of the craziness going on. And you miss some of that. And we miss, we had gotten a good start over in the nursing home ministry there before everything got shut down. And we got to fellowship and go and sing and try to be a blessing. And, and you miss some of that. We need Christian fellowship. And what, the, what happens is there's a building that delights God, and there's a building that God's building, and he's, he's got his, his, uh, his workmanship, and he's got the materials that he's building that's made up of all of us. We're all part of it. And it does matter. The kids matter, and the adults matter, and the older people matter, and all of us are part of the building, and we make it all up, and the idea is that we can fellowship now. We're fellow citizens, he says. So we have fellowship, verse number 19, but notice he says, fellow citizens with the saints. And then he says, of the household. There's a family there. Take your Bible, if you will, and flip over to um, first, uh, first Timothy chapter 3. First Timothy chapter number 3. You'll see this mentioned at the end of Ephesians as well. But 1 Timothy chapter number 3, look in verse number 14. These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know, in other words, I'm writing these things, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. Now he's not talking about, you know, little kids shouldn't run in the church building. They didn't have church buildings when this was written. So he's not talking about the physical structure. The house of God, you're looking at it. Look around. This is the house of God. This right here is building. This thing's going to burn up one day. I know we refer to the church building sometimes as the house of God. I'm not telling you to change your language and your nomenclature. But you need to understand, we make up the church. Calvary Baptist Church is people. It's not, it's not a structure. But look at the verse, look what he says, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. The, the thing that strikes me is this. If we are a family, then we have to learn how to behave ourselves. You know, when he talks to Timothy and he gives him some instructions, he talks about how to treat the older widows and how to take care of them. He talks about the women and even the younger women. He says you need to treat them as sisters with purity. He talks about the younger men. They need to be sober-minded. He talks about our behavior. And I'm not going to set up a uh, you know, behavior class one-on-one -on -one and teach you, you know, how to open a door for a young lady. But you need to learn some things. Your parents ought to be teaching you some things, young, young people. And there ought to be a certain behavior that we should have that is conducive to a family that's respectful because we're part of this building. We're part of this household. But here's another thing that strikes me because it goes beyond just how we treat each other. It's a reflection on the testimony that we carry out into the world because he says we're the pillar and ground of the truth. Now look, thank God we have the Bible. Amen. I'm so glad we can go back to the source. I do read a lot. I read old-time preachers, young preachers. I read all kind of material. I study church history. I like that. I study theology. Um, I understand all that systematic theology. I don't care what theologian there is out there. The Bible is the final authority. We go back to this book right here. Okay, this, we can go back and say, okay, we got this theologian, man, he did some real good things, you know. Yeah, Martin Luther, you know, the Reformation. Really, I don't think we'd have what's called the United States of America if you did not have the Protestant Reformation. The ideas of freedom and different things that are spun off from that, I really don't believe you would have the revolution of America. You can go argue whatever you want to say. But Martin Luther as a theologian, there, he's got some problems. <laughs> And you say, how do you know? Are you smarter than Martin Luther? No, the guy was a genius. There's no doubt in my mind. 
but I can judge Martin Luther by this book right here. We got the source. We can go back and say, okay, you're not supposed to sprinkle babies, not according to the Bible. You're not predestined to heaven or hell, not according to the Bible. You need to leave Rome. <laughs> you know, this idea of Martin never would have left Rome if Rome wouldn't have kicked him out. Okay? He did get some things right, but I'm saying you can look at all the theologians and go through history. We have the source book right here. However, I said all that to say this. A lot of people out in the world, they're not reading the Bible. They're reading you. The only Bible they ever read is going to be your life and your testimony. You're the pillar and ground of the truth. You ever think of it that way? The truth that's being propagated and put out in this world is being carried by us. Now, we've got the source. We can tell people, you know, here's 1,189 chapters. Go home and read it. And they're going to be like, I ain't never read a book a day in my life. You're telling me to read this? Yeah. Uh, it's called a book. B-O-O-K. It has pages in it. And it's not, you know, 15 seconds you flip the screens. You know, pretty soon all public libraries only have two books in them, I guess, Brother Jim. <laughs> We're living in a world where young people are growing up and they're not learning how to read and they're not wanting to read. And we have a responsibility to convey the Word of God. It's, it's up to us. So this idea of family, this idea of us having a responsibility, I think, is real prevalent here in the book of Ephesians because we're fellow citizens. We're supposed to get along. If we're fighting and bickering with one another, what is that going to say to the world? You know? Because the only thing they know is, and here how, you know how people are. It's kind of like you. You ever have a bad experience at a restaurant? It could have been five years ago, and you're like, man, I ain't going to eat there. Man, they've already changed cooks. They've already changed managers. They've changed franchises. The only thing left is the original door on the front. Everything else is different. Be like, I ain't going there. I went there one time and they gave me a hamburger and in the middle of it was still frozen. Okay, well, uh, it's a whole different place. Well, you know, I ain't going back to that church, you know. It's been 25 years. But yet people, when they have a bad experience with church people, I'm telling you, it affects them. Because they're not going to read. They're not thinking, oh, well, that church has a good doctrinal statement. That church stands on the King James Bible. That church, there's, there's people in there that have read their Bible, and there are some good people, and they've given the mission. They're not thinking that. All they're thinking is, yeah, I heard so-and-so said such-and-such, or so-and-so, I saw him walking out of the grocery store, and he had beer in his buggy. If you got beer in the buggy, you got a problem, amen. Now, I'm going to preach it. I'm going to preach on it. Don't be coming out with beer in the buggy. It's sad that you got situation where people that's what they're looking at they're looking to judge and the devil will use that stuff we're to be fellow citizens because because we're a family you got a problem with someone you need to pray for them you need to go to them be honest be forgiving forgive one another as god for christ's sake hath forgiven you you see someone that's overtaken in a fault, what does he say? Kick them while they're down. No, that's not what he says. He says, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. You might have done worse if you were in the same situation. Somebody's fallen, the last thing they need you, need you to do is put a big A on them and parade them down in front of the church and rebuke them in front of everybody. Why don't you try to forgive them? Why don't you try to restore them? Why don't you pray for them? Why don't you try to help them? And so we want to make sure we see this kind of spirit that's coming out in this passage about being fellow citizens with the saint. We're a household. We're supposed to be a family. I think sometimes we get a little institutionalized. And I know we, we need to have Bible study, and I know you come to learn. Sometimes you just come and sit and observe and leave, and it needs to be a little bit beyond that. We have a prayer list, and you need to be praying for one another, and you need to Consider one another. Go out of your way maybe to befriend someone. And realize we have a family. Notice, and I'll try to wrap it up here. Verse number 20, there's a foundation here. But notice he mentions the foundation as the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Ephesians 2, verse number 20. The apostles and prophets... Now, when you read about the apostles and prophets in the book of Acts, obviously that's a foundation that's being laid. And we understand uh, that this foundation is, is being laid and there's no need anymore for new prophets. Uh, here's the idea. If these prophets are giving us something that's not in the Bible, we don't need to listen to them. If they're giving, these supposed prophets, if they're giving us something that's in the Bible, we don't need them anyway. 
So you see these churches and they say, you know, church such and such incorporated, you know, apostle so-and-so. What do you mean apostle so-and-so? He's not an apostle. Does he have the apostolic sign gifts? Is he raising people from the dead and uh, casting out devils and, and uh, healing people miraculously? No, he's not. He's not an apostle. He's a fraud and he's not a prophet. And you hear this stuff all the time, and then you got Mormonism and different things like that, and Seventh-day Adventists, and they have these prophets. You ever notice how many times these prophets are women? I'm just saying. You read about Jezebel, the false prophetess over there in the book of Revelation. They seduce people. And this, this idea of somebody being a prophet, there's a foundation that's laid in the early church of apostles and prophets. And you see that in the book of Acts. Remember Philip, Philip the evangelist. He had seven daughters that prophesied. The Bible's not complete at that point. Remember Agabus, he's a prophet, Acts chapter 11. He grabs a hold of Paul's girdle and says, Thus saith the Holy Ghost, the man that has this girdle is going to go to Jerusalem and be arrested and all this stuff. You know, we have Acts 21, I think. We have different prophets in the book of Acts. That's the foundation. The Bible's not complete. They don't even have a completed New Testament at that point. That's the foundation. You read about those apostles there in the New Jerusalem, their names being on those foundations. So we have that foundation. But then it goes beyond that. Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. And thank God for that. But notice the building. There's a framework. Verse number 21. In whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple. You ever see those carpenters? Some of you young guys in here, you're doing woodwork and things like that. And it's neat to watch you do these things. And you ever see some of these, these people that can build stuff and they don't use nails? They take wood and they cut it just and they have the old wood pegs where they can use the pegs and use the wood and there's not a nail anywhere, kind of like the old uh, temple and tabernacle and all that stuff. That's amazing to me. Every piece, it's like, you know, nowadays you cut your trim, you get all your trim work, and then you take the trusty old caulk, right? And you take the caulk and you wet your finger and you put your caulk on, then you paint it and everything looks all like it's fit. It really didn't fit all that good. The caulk covered a lot of stuff up. I got some carpenters and, you know, guys out here, you know what I'm talking about. It looks real good after you get done. But can you imagine being of such a precise workmanship and master craft quality that you can have everything fit just like it's supposed to go? That's how the Lord wants to fit the church. He has all of us in our little spots. And there's no hierarchy. I'm not better than you because I'm a preacher. I understand how the term man of God is used, but I also have seen that abused in a lot of churches where the pastors and preachers are walking, along, walking around like peacocks. The man of God, touch not the Lord's anointed, I'm the man of God. And they, they start talking about all this, you know, doctor so-and-so and doctor so-and-so. You need some kind of intern to come along and clean up the mess the doctors make. Amen. But it's this idea that the man of God some kind of hierarchy. I understand there's a position and there's authority with that position. I get that. But I'm no better than you. I have a different position. And I'm going to give account for, uh, to God for leading this church in my position. But you're going to give account to God for your position in this church. And it does matter. You say, well, I'm just a pew warmer. I'm just somebody that sits on the pew and I pray. That matters to God. You say, well, I'm just an older person. I can't go out. I didn't get to go out in the parade and march down there. No, we didn't want you to walk because we didn't want you to get hurt and have to do things maybe your body's not able to do. But that's okay. You're still part of this thing. And we're glad you're part of it. No big me and little you. It fits together just like it's supposed to fit. God has made all of our personalities. I love the book of Colossians when he makes a statement. He's dealing with Gnosticism. All these people that have this kind of spiritism, they think, oh, we know something you don't know. And now you've got to get in the know if you kind of fellowship with us. That's what was going on in Colossus. He says in Colossians, he says, ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. God made you a certain way. Don't be ashamed of it. Look, I'm not saying there are certain things you don't need to work on in your Christian life. But everybody is not a public speaker. Everybody just can't stand up and talk in front of people. And everybody is not just made the same way. Some of you, you're, you need to be a little more um, forgiving. You have maybe an outgoing personality, and you can talk to a tree, you know, and you done talk in five minutes before you realize there wasn't a person standing beside you. You know, you're not ashamed, you're not bashful at all. And you're like, how come somebody can't come out of their shell? Well, you're just wired differently. Men and women are different. Amen. We need to put that in the schools. You know, there is a difference. The plumbing is different. Everything's different. God made us different. Celebrate diversity. You're different.
It's okay. Some people have big noses. Some people have big foreheads. Some people have ears that poke out. That's okay. Some people are ugly. Some people ain't ugly. It's good. I'm glad we're different. I'm glad we're all not handsome like me, right? <laughs> I'm glad some of you, some of you guys, I'm glad some of you still have hair. At least we can celebrate the fact that some of you keep, kept your hair. You know, us that don't have it, we're, we're glad some of you do, you know. That's good. Um, but this idea of, of uh, this, is I, this is how I am, so then everybody's got to be like me, you're losing the point. God has got us in a different place. Yeah, there's some things you need to work on in your Christian life, but He has you to fit also as you change in your life. You young people in here, your kids, you have a pretty big job, and that job is do what your parents tell you to do. Sorry. That's your job. As you get a little bit older, you know what's going to happen? That relationship's going to change, and you're going to take different responsibilities. But all stages of your life, you're going to move from being, listen to me now, you ain't going to like it, you're going to move from being in under one authority to being under another authority. From the next authority to the next authority, from the next authority. We're all under authority. These adults are under authority. You think, you know, the coffee pot just goes off automatically? No, somebody's got to set it. It's supposed to be the guys because it says Hebrews. <laughs> All right? <laughs> you, have, you have to, you're under authority. And so we have to realize as we change in life, things may change. Your personality and character and some of the things might not change, but you're complete in Him and we've got to realize God wants us to function where He puts us. Now, there are different types here. Now, here we'll close it out by looking at this. He mentions the building... And he mentions it grows together in holy temple in the Lord. Now in the Old Testament we have the temple and we have the tabernacle. Now it's interesting that the tabernacle in 1 Samuel is actually called a temple. The word temple is used interchangeably, which is interesting. Sometimes when we think of Bible prophecy we think, well, you know, we know there's going to be a restored temple in Jerusalem because we know the Antichrist, when he comes, he's going to go in that temple and do the abomination that maketh desolate where he sets up the image in the Holy of Holies. So we understand there has to be a restored temple. However, it doesn't take very long to set up a tabernacle. You ever put up a tent? If you, well, if you don't read the instructions, it might take a little while. But that Old Testament tabernacle, they could get the thing up pretty quickly. That thing is used interchangeably there in 1 Samuel, which is interesting because you have two types. You have the tabernacle, which is mystical in meaning, and then you have the temple, which is millennial in meaning. You know, when Jesus Christ comes back, there's going to be a millennial temple, a temple that will be exercised and used in the millennial kingdom. And so we have Solomon's temple, which is, of course, the structure with all the gold, the ornate gold and the cherubim, different measurements than the tabernacle. The tabernacle is basically a tent put up with boards. There's two types, though. You're going to see when you look at the typology, the tabernacle has more typology dealing with the church, and the temple has more typology dealing with the nation of Israel. So I found that very interesting because when you think about the boards, you ever read over there in Exodus? I know you do. You do your Bible reading. You get over there and you start reading in Exodus, about 28, and you start going through there and he starts describing all the details, all the materials they have to gather to make this little tabernacle. Then he gets through, he repeats the whole thing. And he gives all this emphasis on getting this different type of wood and so forth. And he goes through there about these boards of the tabernacle. Look at it in verse number 21. He talks about it being framed. You ever notice how fast, man, some of these crews can get together. They can put up a structure in a minute. They can frame something really quick. They frame it up. They got a crew, they go in there and they frame it with the boards. The tabernacle boards, they take those trees and they cut them down. The life is terminated. The, the, the tree's cut down. Your old life has been terminated. Then the boards, they begin to fashion those boards. God takes your life, and your old life is dead and buried. That's what baptism pictures. It pictures a death, a burial, and a resurrection. Your old life is terminated. Now he begins to fashion you. Okay. Then he takes those boards, and he encases them in gold. He puts them in sockets of silver. And those boards are side by side. We're, we're supposed to be side by side. We're not, we're, we're in, I hate using the phrase now because of the crazy COVID thing. We're in this together. Join hands and walk down the, 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 the forward aisle in the grocery store and don't go down the wrong aisle. And Oh, man. But as the body of Christ, we're to be together. They're side by side. But you know those boards, you ever read about that invisible board? 
There's a board that goes through all those boards to connect them. If you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit of God going through you and it's going through me and it should, it should connect all of us together. We have unity and diversity by the common denominator. The blood of Christ has bought us and now we're all saved. And yeah, you know, you might like uh, Twinkies and I might like Oreos. And you know, I'm not going to throw an Oreo at you and don't throw a Twinkie at me. I might eat it. There's, there's differences but there's a common denominator, there's a thread, there's an invisible board that ties all of us together. And it, and it strengthens us. It goes through the heart of all of us. So we have a building that's framed. And notice it says it grows. Look at that. Groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are builded together for an habitation of God. What, what's the point of all this? The point is we are to grow together so God will be pleased. You know, we, we invite visitors and uh, invite people to come to church, and you should. I appreciate that. We want people to come, but more importantly, we want God to be here. We want the Lord to feel welcome among us. We don't want Him to feel like He's being pushed out and being pushed aside. If you're pushing Him out in your own life, when you come in here and we gather collectively, that's going to have an effect on all of us going to have an effect on how you treat one another. There's, it's interesting, the phrase in verse 22, the habitation of God, that's used in contrast, really, when you read about Babylon the Great in Revelation 18, it mentions Babylon the Great is a habitation of devils. And I don't want to get real weird, especially it's getting late, and we're about to leave, you're going to go home and have nightmares. You ever go in a place, and, it, and I'm talking about the building, the structure, you walk in and it just feels weird? Am I the only one that that happens to? You ever go somewhere? You ever been in a church and it feels weird? Maybe in a church service with people in there. And you're like, man, I think I'm out of place. Something ain't right. Or you ever been somewhere and there's just a what we would call a bad spirit. There's, a, there's, there's something else present there. And the Bible teaches there are things in the unseen world that affect our, we have a spirit. Now we are conscious of ourselves because of our body, but we have a spirit. You can be affected by those things. Mainly through the eye gate and through the ear gate, but you can sometimes feel that pressure. And here the contrast is that we want to be a habitation of God. Our body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which we have of God. Collectively as we come together and collectively as we unite in, in our unity of serving Christ, we want God to dwell among us and be pleased to dwell among us instead of the contrary idea of being a habitation of devils and unclean spirits like the wickedness out in our world. The basis of our unity is Christ's blood, His body, and His building. In verse 21, the key is we grow together. I don't have it all figured out yet and I don't think you do either, but the idea is that we are a body, we are a building, and we are to grow together. And I'm glad we can have unity in diversity. And that unity is the blood of Jesus Christ. And thank God that we can set aside some of the petty differences. Now, if it's a doctrinal thing, obviously Paul said, Mark, those that cause division among you. I mean, there comes a line you have to draw in the sand and say, well, I can't go any further. But it's a blessing to have brothers and sisters in Christ that we can partner with and say, hey, we're trying to serve the Lord together and it's all because of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Let's all stand and be dismissed in prayer.